Thank you very much, Ralph. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is great to be here in Cooperstown. And I want to tell you, I'm, I'm just honored to be up here with all these great uh, Hall of Famers. And uh, uh, it's just like a dream come true for me. And it really is a distinct honor to be the recipient of the Ford C. Frick Award. Uh, just briefly, uh, I guess like a lot of young boys growing up, and I was back in Richmond, Virginia, my hometown, had a dream of being a Major League Baseball player. Uh, my dad had passed away when I was seven, and my mother really got me interested in baseball. And uh, when I grew up a little low, I realized that if I was going to get to the major leagues, I better have a different route than being a ball player. But luckily for me, I was always kind of fascinated with broadcasting. I, I remember going home at night, and I'd twist that radio dial and maybe pick up Mel Allen doing the Yankees, uh, Red Barber and Ernie Harwell doing the Dodgers. And I used to think, boy, what a great job that must be. So I decided to take a stab at it, and I got my foot in the door in the local station in Richmond. And then, as Ralph mentioned, uh, I went to WSYR in Syracuse. Didn't have any baseball, but one year I did uh, the public address announcing at MacArthur Stadium in Syracuse, the home of the Syracuse Chiefs. And for <laughs> oh, I've got some Syracusans here. And for that job, I was paid the princely sum of three dollars per game, five dollars for a doubleheader. And then I got my first break when Springfield acquired a franchise uh, in the International League. Uh, so having worked in Syracuse and uh, Springfield, they're both, I guess, an uh, hour and a half or so from here, I honestly feel a little bit at home in this uh, part of the country. But honestly, too, I feel a little out of place uh, today because uh, my team, the Twins, are playing the Red Sox at Fenway Park, and I'm not there to, to work with my partner, John Gordon, on the play-by-play -play today. But uh, I want to say that my family uh, has gotten used to the upside-down schedule that people in baseball uh, have, and uh, this has really helped me out a great deal. And I just want to introduce very briefly some of my uh, family members, the close family members who are here today, because as far as I'm concerned, this is as much their day as it is mine. My wife, Kathy, who's been a tremendous help to me over the years, and. Uh, we were married when I was doing the Springfield Cubs. Got married on September 12th. Didn't have sense enough to wait and a little later. Now we can't do anything but go to a ball game on our anniversary. But uh, uh, our daughter Terry is here with uh, her husband Richard. And we have some of our grandkids, Bobby, Rick, and Matthew. I just want to say a very few words about a player, I think, who has been kind of overlooked. And I, I know I'm not alone, because uh, there are a lot of people who are hoping that Tony Oliva, uh, a former outfielder for the Twins, they're really hoping that in the future Tony will, will get some more consideration as far as getting into the Hall of Fame. Now, I know you look at his bottom line, he didn't have the numbers, but uh, consider this, uh, he could have played probably another seven or eight years had it not been for so many uh, knee operations. He's the only player in the history of the major leagues to win batting championships his first two years in the majors. He won another batting championship, three batting titles, despite the fact that he lost about eight years out of his career. And uh, I, to me, I don't think there's any doubt that if Tony could have had a full career, uh, career he would have uh, collected over 3,000 hits and almost been an automatic uh, inductee into the Hall of Fame. Well, I, I think if you ask players who played with Tony or against him, uh, they will tell you without exception that he was a great ball player. Uh, having been in the business so long, now and then people say, well, what are some of the highlights? Believe me, after you've been in it over 40 years, they're too numerous uh, to mention. Uh, I wasn't there, of course, uh, to see Jim Bunning's perfect game in the National League, but uh, I did have the opportunity to broadcast a perfect game four years later at Oakland. Unfortunately, it was against the Twins. Jim Catfish Hunter pitched the perfect game against the Twins in 1968. And we had a little bit of drama in the ninth inning of that game. Oakland was leading four to nothing. The Twins uh, came up, first two men went out. But our first baseman, left-handed batting Rich Reese, went to a three and two count 
And so here's Jim Hunter's perfect game, hinging on the next pitch, and Reese swung and missed. So Catfish got his perfect game, and as I recall, Catfish himself had uh, three hits in that game. But I've been so fortunate in this business with the Twins to have uh, had the opportunity to be involved in three World Series, 1965, 87, and 91, and I'm sure you're aware, a lot of baseball people rate the 91 series uh, one of, if not the greatest World Series ever played. And I still remember coming back from Atlanta, the uh, Twins are down three games to two, and Kirby Puckett hitting a home run in game six to tie the series. And in game seven, the old war horse Jack Morris pitching a great 10 inning, one to nothing shutout, a pinch hit by Gene Larkin, won it for the Twins. So they were really some of uh, the greatest times that, that I've ever had. And folks, uh, I just want to say uh, again how honored I am to receive the Ford Frick Award. And I want everybody to know that I will never forget the privilege that I've had of being able to make uh, baseball a lifelong career. It's meant so much to my family and to me. And in closing, I would just like to offer my thanks, my sincere thanks to God, to my family, to some good friends, and to baseball itself, because they have all played such an important part in making it possible for me to just to be here today. Thank you very much.